Welcome once again into the Radiopedia reading room, our dingy little club. We don't read no books down here, we sip Negronis in our scrubs. That's a reference to last episode, Gaylard, for the true fans. This is a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon, and joining me, sometimes I think he brings only a pseudo response to this podcast, but today... I suspect he'll bring a super response. It's my co-host, Frank Gaylard. Yes, we're doing glioblastoma today. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite topics. And I get to listen to you read the glioblastoma article from Radiopedia to me. That's right. Yes, this is a readful episode. Our hostful readful, our first one ever. (laughs) So just you and me. I reckon if you were on a game show, Gaylord, like Mastermind or Hard Quiz, it'd be like, our next contestant is Frank Gaylord, and his special subject is glioblastoma. <laughs> hey, Frank, you must be very popular at parties. <laughs> you know, nothing quite holds the attention of an entire room as, I don't know, discussing the latest changes in the WHO classification of CNS tumors. <laughs> <laughs> There's a methylated corner of the room and an unmethylated corner. <laughs> Now, do you think we should get straight into this one? Because it's quite a long article and no doubt we'll ramble on about things halfway through anyway. So nothing random up top. Let's just get straight into it. Yep, let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to read the Radiopedia article on glioblastoma. This is in May 2024. The article may change in the future. I'm going to read it word for word and then Gaylord's going to cut in with uh, his expert insights. All right, (laughs) here we go. Glioblastomas, GBM are the most common adult primary brain tumour and are aggressive, relatively resistant to therapy and have a correspondingly poor prognosis. They typically appear as heterogeneous masses centred in the white matter with irregular peripheral enhancement, central necrosis and surrounding vasogenic edema. Treatment primarily consists of surgery with concurrent radiotherapy and timazolamide. I think we'll move straight on to the terminology section, Gaylard, after Mm -hmm. that beautiful intro. Since 1926, when the term glioblastoma multiforme was coined, the definition of this tumour has substantially changed, particularly over the last decade, with an increasing reliance on molecular markers to define these tumours. And the next little subheading here is IDH wild type. Mm -hmm. So in the fifth edition, 2021, of the WHO classification of CNS tumours, Frank has one stored under his pillow for nighttime reading. (laughs) Uh, Glioblastomas have been defined as diffuse astrocytic tumours in adults that must be IDH wild type and are now an entirely separate diagnosis from astrocytoma IDH mutant grade 2, 3 or 4. Explain, Gaylord. Well, so this is a really important change and one that um, still seems not to have really percolated through many people. And, And this is that... We've spent so long thinking about necrosis and other histologic changes as being the defining feature of glioblastoma and that an astrocytoma could grow up to be a glioblastoma by eventually developing necrosis. And that's no longer the case. So the classification is entirely based on IDH mutant status. And if you are IDH wild type, meaning you don't have an IDH, an isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation, then you are a glioblastoma. Whereas if you do have a mutation, you're an astrocytoma. And if you are an astrocytoma that develops necrosis, you still stay an astrocytoma. You just become a grade four astrocytoma. And if you are a wild type astrocytic adult type tumor without necrosis, and histologically you appear low grade, Almost always you're going to be a glioblastoma anyway, and I'm sure we'll we'll cover that later. The next little section here says multiforme. Glioblastoma was previously known as glioblastoma multiforme. The multiforme referred to the tumor heterogeneity. In the revised fourth edition, 2016, which Gaylard's put away in the cupboard now, yep. the term multiforme was dropped, with these tumors referred to merely as glioblastomas. In the revised fourth edition, the abbreviation GBM was kept for disambiguation. However, it appears to have been deprecated in the fifth edition summary. Yeah, so good luck getting rid of GBM because everyone calls it a GBM. But please don't use the term multiforme anymore. Nothing dates you as being at least eight years out of date (laughs) as saying that. So don't do it. It's GBM and now people are saying, oh, the... The M in glioblastoma refers to the 
Glai, oh, blast, oh, ma. Ma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good one. Yeah, so if you use that term, you get kicked out of a Gaylard party. You're not allowed to stay. You're out. Yep, you're out. All right, the next little section is primary and secondary. Glioblastomas had traditionally been divided into primary and secondary, the former arising de novo, 90%, and the latter developing from a pre existing lower grade tumour, 10%. These historical terms now correlate closely to RDH mutation status, which should no longer be used. Primary glioblastomas largely equate to glioblastoma IDH wild type, whereas secondary glioblastomas now equate to astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO CNS grade 4. Yeah, you'll still see them in older literature, obviously, but uh, you should never really refer to primary or secondary GBM in your reports. Yep. Should we talk about IDH status a little bit more, do you think? Do I have a choice of stopping you here, Gayla? Not really. (laughs) Okay, okay. carry on then. Look, so uh, a lot of molecular markers are take it or leave it unless you're really in an academic centre. But IDH is something that I think you do need to know even if you just report MRs occasionally because it is such a foundational part of the classification system and also it's really a bit interesting it explains a lot of things about diffuse gliomas so idh is uh isocitrate dehydrogenase and dixon i know you probably have a poster of the krebs cycle on your uh on your bedroom wall uh well it's tattooed on my back but yep (laughs) and so it's one of those enzymes but actually the one that's in the citric acid cycle or krebs cycle is idh3 and that's not the one that we're interested in for tumors we're talking about idh1 and idh2 same gene one of them is in the cytoplasm one of them in the mitochondria and it takes uh, isocitrate and uh, makes it into alpha ketoglutarate which then goes on and has lots of effects on DNA methylation, et cetera. Now, what's kind of unique about IDH mutations is that when you mutate uh, either IDH1 or IDH2, they not only stop doing the normal thing they do, but they gain function and they gain the ability to take alpha-ketoglutarate and make it into 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is not a normal compound. But this compound has two really interesting effects. One of them is that it's similar to glutamate, which is a primary excitatory neurotransmitter. And so that's why IDH mutant tumors are so much more likely to cause epilepsy than Mm. similar histologically appearing other tumors because they're kind of accumulating this compound that's similar to glutamate. The other thing is that the accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutarate is actually toxic for the cells. And so IDH mutant tumors are more indolent than Mm. those that are wild type, which is something I never kind of, when you think of a mutation, usually that's a bad thing. Whereas glioblastoma is wild type, which is normal IDH status, but it behaves so much worse. And that's at least part of the reason. Yeah. So the mutants have got a bit of a negative feedback loop. That's right. So it simultaneously causes or is part of the reason why the tumors arise but also holds them back from being really virulent. Now, I feel like I just got trapped in the corner at one of your parties. Um. (laughs) (laughs) That's the secret. You have to back them into a corner with no doors. It was fascinating, but I've just seen someone else across the road. I've just been meaning to talk to this. I've I've just got to go to the bathroom. All right, should we move on? The next little section here is variants. So in the fifth edition 2021 WHO classification of CNS tumors blue book, Three glioblastoma histological variants are recognized, as well as a number of histological patterns. So the three recognized variants are giant cell glioblastoma, gliosarcoma, and epithelioid glioblastoma. Now, anything useful from those three, Gaylord? No, I, I, I don't really think of these ever. I can't remember ever finding it useful. The, th- the growth pattern that's not listed there that I think is worth thinking about because it used to be considered its own entity, grade four, mm-hmm. but now is just a pattern is glymatosis. Yep. That's not unique to glioblastoma. You can be mutant glymatosis as well. But now just recognize that it is just a pattern, not a diagnosis. And you're saying gliomatosis rather than gliomatosis cerebri because it's not necessarily always in the cerebrum? Is that what you're it's, saying? I mean, usually it's uh, cerebral hemispheres, but you can get it extending into deeper structures and even going down into the brainstem. 
but I'm lazy. I just do you say, say glymatosis cerebri pattern or glymatosis pattern? I just say glymatosis pattern, but maybe that's like the rebel in me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, rebel. Time for the epidemiology. So mm-hmm. glioblastomas, now defined as RDH wild type tumors, are essentially tumors of adults, usually occurring after the age of forty, with a peak incidence between sixty-five and seventy-five years of age. There is a slight male preponderance with a 3 to 2 male to female ratio. White patients are affected more frequently than other ethnicities. The prevalence in Europe and North America is 3 to 4 per 100,000, whereas in Asia it is 0.59 per 100,000. Definitely see a lot in Melbourne. Hmm. The vast majority of glioblastomas are sporadic. Rarely they are related to prior radiation exposure. They can also occur as part of rare inherited tumor syndromes, such as P53 mutation-related syndromes, including neurofibromatosis type 1. Other syndromes in which glioblastomas are encountered include Turcotte syndrome, Ollier disease, and Mifuchi syndrome. Those ones get, what, enchondromas. Yeah, so the demographics is really important if you're trying to predict whether something's a glioblastoma or an astrocytoma, because the incidence of IDH mutation is very, very, very tightly correlated with age. So if you are under the age of 50 and you have a tumor that looks like a diffuse glioma, it's really most likely that it's going to be a mutant tumor, even if it's got areas of necrosis. Whereas in a 70 or 80 year old, if you see something that looks like a low grade glioma, And histologically, it may well be a low-grade glioma. It's almost certainly going to be IDH wild type, in which case it is actually a molecular glioblastoma, also known as a stealth GBM because it sneaks up on you. It sneaks up. Okay, so (laughs) the the older patients, don't be too tempted to call something a low-grade tumor. It's still almost certainly going to be a glioblastoma unless you've seen it there for many, many, many years. Yeah, and, and that's important because... If it's the first study and you say, oh, this looks like a low-grade glioma, and this patient goes to a clinician who's not super familiar with the idea of molecular glioblastoma, especially if they still read the older literature that said that low-grade gliomas you know, take five years to 10 years to progress and that you just watch them and you don't treat them, then that patient might be reassured and sent off for a scan mm. in a year and then represent two or three months later with a massive tumour because these evolve very, very quickly. Next section is clinical presentation. So patients typically present in one of the following three ways, a focal neurological deficit, symptoms of increased intracranial pressure and or seizures. Rarely, less than 2% of the time, intratumoral hemorrhage occurs and patients may present acutely with stroke-like symptoms and signs. Yeah, presentation doesn't help you very much in brain tumors because they all kind of present a little bit the same way. As I mentioned, seizures are particularly common in IDH mutant lower grade tumors, but it's still a very common way of a glioblastoma to present as well. Mm. The less than 2%, definitely less than 2%. I mean, I can only think of one or two cases where patients Mm. have presented with a hemorrhage and then found to have an adjacent glioblastoma. Which is interesting because we often see a spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, like a low bar hemorrhage, and we follow them up to exclude an underlying tumour. And the vast majority of those that we follow up, there's nothing there, right? Yeah. So this kind of supports it, doesn't it? Let's move on to the next section. So this is diagnosis. The fifth edition, 2021, of the WHO classification of CNS tumours incorporates molecular parameters into the diagnostic criteria. In this classification, to make the diagnosis of glioblastoma, the following are required adult patient, diffuse astrocytic tumour, and IDH wild type. And there's a footnote here as well, Gaylord. It says an IDH wild type status can be reached without the need for sequencing in patients over the age of 55 years on the basis of negative IDH1R132H immunohistochemistry, as the likelihood of finding other IDH mutations in older age is very unlikely. So this is probably worth uh, unpacking a little bit because you'll come across this terminology a lot and sometimes it'll be in requests where they're justifying whether something is an IDH wild type tumor or not and it's on the basis of um, immunohistochemistry. So the first thing to say is immunohistochemistry is really cheap, easy. It's done in Mm -hmm. normal path labs. Uh, It's a combination of an immunoreactive stain 
on a slide. So it's done very frequently. And because it's immunoreactive, it targets specific antigens. And in this case, it targets IDH1 mutations where the arginine, that's the R in R132H, the arginine residue at position 132 is replaced by a histidine. That's what that means. And that accounts for about 70 to 80% of all IDH mutations. So if you find that mutation, you're gold because that tells you you do have an IDH mutation. Yeah. If the immunohistochemistry for that one mutation is negative, the chances of you having a another mutation of IDH1 or an IDH2 mutation depends on your age. Mm-hmm. And so if you are, say, 40, even if your IDH1 immunohistochemistry is negative, you'll probably find another type of mutation. Whereas if you're elderly, the chances are really, really low. So whether you bother to send the sample to a lab that does next generation sequencing to find those non-R132H mutations really depends on the age of the patient. And the WHO recommends a cutoff of 55 years. I often hear that at our tumor boards, it's often the oncologist going, oh yeah, we should send that one off for NGS. And it's presumably based on the, on the patient's age rather than trusting the immunohistochemistry. Yeah. So we had those three things that it must have. So it must be an adult patient, it must be a diffuse astrocytic tumour, and it must be IDH wild type for it to be glioblastoma. But then there must also be at least one of the following list of things, necrosis, microvascular proliferation, tert promoter mutation, EGFR gene amplification, And the final one is combined gain of whole chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10. And that's also called plus 7 minus 10. Is that right? Yep. So in the rare situation where these criteria are not met, it is likely the tumour will be denoted as not elsewhere classified, so NEC, so glioblastoma NEC, although a variety of paediatric type diffuse gliomas may be worth considering. Yeah, so this is uncommon to be in this situation because almost always when you have an IDH wild type adult diffuse astrocytic tumor, uh, you're, you're going to have one of these. But it's pointing out that sometimes you might be looking at a weird other tumor that's either not included in the classification normally, and that's the NEC, not elsewhere classified, or that it is included elsewhere, but usually occurs in pediatric patients. And so this will usually be an issue in younger adults rather than your 70-year-old. So this is uncommon as well. The other term that I think is worth just mentioning here, because I don't think it's mentioned elsewhere, is not otherwise specified, NOS. And uh, this denotes diagnoses where the molecular, well, where all the criteria that are required by the current WHO classification have not been assessed. So if you're in a place where you rely on just histology to make your diagnosis, then you can't actually call it glioblastoma IDH wild type because you haven't done yep. that. You have to call it glioblastoma NOS, which is just saying this isn't being fully characterized. And it's worth knowing that when you're looking at any publications that are before 2020 or Mm. 2010, every time you see the word glioblastoma, you're actually looking at one of these not fully characterized. And so all the old literature includes all sorts of stuff grouped together that now would be split off into different. It's all pre-molecular diagnosis. The next big section here, Gaylard, is pathology. So although glioblastomas can arise anywhere within the brain, they have a predilection for the subcortical white matter and deep grey matter of the cerebral hemispheres, particularly the temporal lobe. Uh, that's a little bit different to you know lower grade tumours, which are often kind of cortically based rather than that subcortical white matter. Mm-hmm. I added a little bit. Sorry, that's supposed to be your job, Gaylon. Sorry, I was <laughs> asleep at the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Macroscopic appearance, not, not particularly relevant to radiologists this bit, but glioblastomas are typically poorly marginated, diffusely infiltrating necrotic masses localised to the cerebral hemispheres. The supratentorial white matter is the most common location. 
These tumors may be firm or gelatinous. Considerable regional variation in appearance is characteristic. Some areas are firm and white, some are soft and yellow, secondary to necrosis, and others are cystic with local hemorrhage. Glioblastomas have significant variability in size from only a few centimeters to lesions that replace a hemisphere. Infiltration beyond the visible tumor margin is always present. These tumors are multifocal in 20% of patients, but are rarely truly multicentric. They may also demonstrate a gliomatosis cerebri growth pattern. Right. So explaining those two terms, multifocal and multicentric, uh, the easy way to explain it is that multifocal exists and multicentric basically doesn't. <laughs> uh, multifocal is what you see all the time, which is a big tumor as defined by the T2 or flare abnormality within which are embedded multiple foci of enhancement, but you're really looking at one tumor. And I would really encourage everyone when interpreting gliomas to not obsess so much on the enhancing component, but actually focus your attention on the non-enhancing, the T2 abnormality excluding vasogenic edema to define where the tumor is. And then think of the enhancing components as being just areas within that in the same way as you might have areas of hemorrhagic change or cystic change, Uh, but not to think of the glioblastoma as the enhancing component. Yeah. We'll get to that later in the MRI signal, but it's recognizing the difference in T2 signal between tumor and vasogenic edema because there's enhancing tumor, there's tumor that's not enhancing, and then there's vasogenic edema and they have a slightly different pattern on on T2. Yeah, that's right. And and multicentric is really uncommon, and that's where you basically are just really unlucky and you have two different tumours. And the importance there is that you you may actually be dealing with two different diagnoses. So you kind of have to biopsy both because one might even be a metastasis and the other one a glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. You're just looking at an unlucky person. Yeah, I have seen patients who had a glioblastoma completely resected disease-free survival for many years, and then they've developed a completely new glioblastoma in another hemisphere, no interjoining T2 signal at all. I guess that's just bad luck or there's some genetic predisposition. Yeah. So the other thing just to mention is when you read the definition of multifocal, it really talks about areas of enhancement that are linked by T2 signal abnormality. The Mm -hmm. caveat to that or the extension of that that I would make is Sometimes you can't really see the T2 signal abnormality, but they're in places where a link is expected. So if you have, for example, a right frontal lobe Mm. tumor and in the contralateral side in the white matter, you have another area that's almost certainly going to be multifocal because there's such dominant white matter tracks across the corpus callosum in that location. So it needs to be uh, implausible that they are linked. Yeah. It's not mentioned here in the macroscopic appearance, but I think we all know it, the propensity for it to grow through the corpus callosum, the so-called butterfly glioma, I guess, is another kind of typical macroscopic appearance that you may get on pathology for a glioblastoma. Uh, Moving on to the microscopic appearance. So histologically, there are pleomorphic astrocytes with marked atypia and numerous mitoses. Necrosis and microvascular proliferation are hallmarks of glioblastomas. Microvascular proliferation results in an abundance of new vessels with a poorly formed blood-brain barrier, permitting the leakage of ionidated contrast and gadolinium into the adjacent extracellular interstitium, resulting in the observed enhancement on CT and MRI respectively. Edema and enhancement are, however, also seen in lower-grade tumours that lack endovascular proliferation, such as diffuse astrocytomas, RDH mutant, and this is thought to be due to disruption of the normal blood-brain barrier by tumor-produced factors. Vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, for example, has been shown to both disrupt the tight junctions between endothelial cells and increase the formation of fenestrations. So I think there's another important thing that's not really discussed here because it's it's more related to lower-grade tumors, but that is that when you think of your diffuse astrocytoma lower-grade appearing, tumor that is increased in T2 signal. It is edema, but it's not vasogenic edema in that it's not increased fluid necessarily coming out of vessels. It can also be reduced ability of the brain with tumor cells to absorb the normal fluid that's leaked into the interstitium, the glymphatic pathway through aquaporin-4 molecules. So there's both increased 
creation of fluid and reduced absorption that play a role. Uh, but when we're talking about vasogenic edema, where it really washes beyond the margins of the tumor, that's where it's pouring out of these badly formed or poorly continent um, <laughs> vessels. A microscopic appearance, I can't really finish without saying the term palisading necrosis because that's just one of my favorite ones. I can't see it in the article. Oh, we should definitely add that in. Yep. I love it when the pathologist says, and there's palisading necrosis. Fence-like <laughs> necrosis. So an area of necrosis where the cells surrounding it are arranged radially in a kind of fence-like pattern. Yeah, it's cool when you see okay. it, isn't it? All right, so now we're on to radiographic features, Gaylard. Here's the juice of the podcast. So glioblastomas are typically large tumors at diagnosis. They often have thick, irregularly enhancing margins and a central necrotic core, which may also have a hemorrhagic component. They are surrounded by vasogenic type edema, which in fact usually contains infiltration by neoplastic cells, almost always. In fact, definitely in the case of glioblastoma, mm. it contains neoplastic cells. But not necessarily all the way. Right, but beyond the enhancing margin. Beyond the enhancing and beyond the nodular areas of non-enhancing tumour, there's a degree of invasion. How far is really variable, which is why you sometimes see these long-term survivors. Mm. They're usually people that had tumours in uh, non-eloquent areas yeah. and an aggressive surgeon who took sort of a margin. And in other patients, you have this glymatosis pattern where basically the whole brain is infiltrated at the time of diagnosis. Yeah. Multifocal disease, which is found in 20% of cases, is where multiple areas of enhancement are connected to each other by abnormal white matter signal, which represents microscopic spread of tumor cells. Multicentric disease, on the other hand, is where no such connection can be seen. We've mentioned that one before. Yeah, so you, you talked about that they usually present as large tumors, and size of tumors is a bit of a funny one. It it gets mentioned often, like when you read papers describing tumors, it's like, oh, these size were this and that. It doesn't really tell you very much because if you're a large tumor, it either means you've grown really quickly or you've grown really slowly. It can be both. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, glioblastomas don't start off as large. They start off presumably as a single cell somewhere and just grow quite quickly. So I don't think size is, is particularly useful. Okay, now we're onto the CT appearance, Gaylord. So irregular thick margins, ISO to slightly hyperattenuating, and that's due to the high cellularity of the tumor. Irregular hypodense center representing necrosis, marked mass effect surrounding vasogenic edema, hemorrhage occasionally seen, calcification is uncommon, intense irregular heterogeneous enhancement of the margins is almost always present. Yeah, it can be challenging on CT, particularly to distinguish glioblastoma from lots of other mm. uh, entities, metastases, subacute infarct, abscesses, etc. And also don't forget that all of these descriptions of glioblastoma really are of the typical glioblastoma, which has necrosis and microvascular proliferation. When you're talking about molecular glioblastomas, where the histology is similar to a low grade, then it'll just look like a low grade astrocytoma. Mm but have those molecular changes. But anyway, CT is kind of rubbish. That's why we invented MRI. Yeah, the only thing I would say on CT is it's even more important than with MRI to kind of look at the chest, abdomen, pelvis. Is there metastatic disease mm. elsewhere? Look at the clinical situation. Does the patient have a fever, raised inflammatory markers? Could this be an abscess? And that's kind of what you're trying to do on the CT is go, could this actually be an abscess? Do I need to get an MRI tonight versus... Yeah an MRI tomorrow during daytime hours for, for a tumour. Uh, so that's where I think the CT interpretation is, is important, putting the clinical context and yeah. other imaging into it. So let's move on to MRI. So on T1, it's a hypo to iso intense mass within the white matter. There's central heterogeneous signal often, and that can be due to necrosis and sometimes intratumoral hemorrhage. On T1 post contrast, you'll have enhancement, which is variable, but is almost always present. Typically, it's peripheral and irregular with nodular components, and it usually surrounds central necrosis. T2 slash flare signal, this is hyperintense, surrounded by vasogenic edema, and flow voids are occasionally seen, and it lacks T2 flare mismatch sign. You're going to explain that one, Gaylord. 
Yeah, so this is an important uh, sign because it's misunderstood. So a T2 flare mismatch sign is where you have a region that's very high on T2 but low or lower on flare. And when you just describe it like that, that could apply to a cyst. Mm. It could apply to the necrotic centre of a glioblastoma, etc. Uh, but that's not what it means. And the, the, the significance of this sign is in the setting of a diffuse... Uh, usually non-enhancing uh, glioma, where you have areas that are so gelatinous that on flare they lose much of their signal. And it's very specific for IDH mutant tumours, but the ones that don't have 1P19Q codeletion. So in other words, not oligodendrogliomas, but rather astrocytomas, IDH mutant. So if you see an area in a non-enhancing tumour that suppresses on flare but is very high on T2, that not only tells you that it's not an oligodendroglioma, but it also tells you that it's not a glioblastoma because it's almost certainly got an IDH mutation. But if you see an enhancing tumour with a central area of necrosis that's high on T2 and attenuates on flare or areas of cyst, that doesn't count. Yep. So don't get, that's just fluid. don't get confused by that sign. And we'll come back to oligodendroglioma a little bit later. I almost mentioned it earlier when we talked about CTE, when we said that calcification is uncommon in glioblastoma, because obviously in oligodendroglioma, you'll often have calcification. But we'll come back to that in the differentials later, I reckon, Gaylard. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to susceptibility-weighted imaging or the gradient imaging. So susceptibility artifact on T2 star from blood products or occasionally from calcification is relatively common, mainly from microscopic hemorrhage rather than from macroscopic hemorrhage, right, Galen? Mm -hmm. uh, low intensity rim from blood products, incomplete and irregular in 85% when present, mostly located inside the peripheral enhancing component. And then it says absent dual rim sign. What does that all mean? So on MR, particularly on susceptibility weighted imaging, it's really common to see little patches of signal loss usually within a glioblastoma, they're within the necrotic cavity at the margins between the cavity and the enhancing component. And you're looking at, you know, areas where tissue has necrosed and there's been a little bit of microscopic hemorrhage sort of clinging to the sides, but it's incomplete. So it doesn't form a complete ring, or if you're thinking three-dimensionally, it doesn't form a complete sphere around the center. This is in contrast to abscesses where the actual enhancing rim of an abscess is so rich in macrophages and oxygen-free radicals and all sorts of enzymes and cytokines that you get a perfectly smooth little thin pencil line hypo intense area on susceptibility weighted imaging. So if you see that complete ring and usually there's an adjacent hyper intense SWI ring, which is why it's called the dual rim sign, then you're looking at an abscess. Whereas if you're just seeing patchy areas of irregular uh, signal loss within the cavity, then that's what glioblastomas or necrotic tumors look like. Yep. And the next section is DWI ADC. And I guess this is probably even more relevant to abscess than the, the dual rim sign, looking mm. to see whether there's any central diffusion restriction. So DWI slash ADC, and we've divided this into the characteristics for the solid component and then the characteristics for the non-enhancing necrotic or cystic component. So elevated signal on DWI is common in the solid enhancing component. Diffusion restriction is typically intermediate, similar to normal white matter, it's important, but significantly elevated compared to the surrounding vasogenic edema, which has facilitated diffusion. ADC values in the solid component tend to be similar to normal white matter, so around 745, plus or minus 135, <laughs> 10 to the minus 6 millimetres per centimetre squared, no, millimetres squared per second. second. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> and then for the non-enhancing necrotic cystic component, so the vast majority, greater than 90%, have facilitated diffusion in this region, so the ADC values are going to be well above 1,000. And care must be taken in interpreting cavities with blood products. Okay, so there's a lot there that I think is worth pointing out because I think diffusion is uh, misunderstood and is really, really helpful in assessing these tumours generally. So talking about the solid 
component, and this is whether it's enhancing or not, it doesn't really matter. You should not really be looking at DWI. You should just be looking at ADC. DWI tells you where to look, but you already know where to look because you've seen the tumor on other sequences. So focus on the ADC maps that give you actual values that you can draw a ROI on it and measure it. When we talk about whether something is diffusion restricting or not, we use all this funny language that comes out of the stroke literature. The reality is that normal brain diffusion restricts quite a lot. And the number for normal white matter is 750, roughly. By the time a tumor is cellular enough that it offsets the edema that it's also producing, it will about reach normal diffusion restriction of brain. So if you're seeing a tumor where the solid component has similar ADC values to normal white matter in the contralateral hemisphere, that is a highly cellular tumor, usually a grade four. A grade two or grade three tumor will have less cells compared to the extra edema that it produces and so will appear facilitated, so whiter on ADC maps. The central necrotic area, you shouldn't really be caring too much about it except when the question is abscess. If you see something that's very diffusion restricting black, then really ask yourself, am I looking at a glioblastoma or am I looking at an abscess? The one caveat to that is if there's enough blood product in there, you will mm. get jet black ADC values and very bright DWI values for months. So yeah. this is usually not really an issue on fresh diagnosis because, as we said, it's not that common to have significant blood product. But it's a really important thing when assessing post-op scans in patients. And so the typical situation is patient has their glioblastoma biopsied or debulked. Then a couple of days later, they develop a fever and you get imaging and the MRI shows, you know, diffusion restriction, in inverted commas, within the cavity. In that setting, because of blood products around, you really can't interpret that. Hmm. But in the virgin tumor, one that hasn't been fiddled around with by, by surgeons, then if you see diffusion restriction centrally within the fluid component, you should probably err on the side of saying this could be an abscess because mm. it's a disaster if you miss it and then they rupture into the ventricles while you're waiting. Whereas a drainage of the center of a glioblastoma, thinking that it's an abscess is not that big a deal. Mm. This is something similar we deal with in subdural empyema after they've been in and had a go at it. Mm. And then it's got some DWI signal in it and it's like, is there blood in there or is there pus? And yeah. a lot of the time you can't really tell and they have to go back in because yeah. they're suspicious clinically that it could be infection. All right, let's move on to the last two little sections of the MRI features. And this is MR perfusion and MR spectroscopy. So MR perfusion, relative cerebral blood volume, RCBV, is elevated compared to lower grade tumors and normal brain. And MR spectroscopy, typical spectroscopic characteristics include choline increased, lactate increased, lipids increased, NAA decreased, and myoinositol decreased. Now, Gayla, do you find perfusion and spectroscopy useful in many settings? Uh, not so much in the first scan. I think no. when it comes to diagnosis, uh, they're not very useful. For spectroscopy in the first place, when you have a thing that is necrotic, you know what that's going to show you regardless of the diagnosis. Mm. It's going to have lipid and lactate centrally without much else. And in the enhancing ugly bit of tumor next to it, whether it's lymphoma or metastasis or glioblastoma, it'll have elevated mm. choline. And that doesn't tell you very much. The utility, I guess, is if you get a nice voxel in adjacent non-enhancing high T2 signal region, and there's unequivocal quite high choline, that pushes you strongly towards an infiltrating tumor rather than a non-infiltrating metastasis, for example. Yeah. And the same thing is for perfusion. But uh, realistically, you don't rely on these to make the diagnosis. These are extremely important in follow-up of gliomas, but not mm. so much in the diagnostic. I mean, 95% of the art of reporting glioblastoma is in the interpretation of follow-up scans, isn't it? And yeah. That's where this kind of stuff gets important. Some people do talk about choline-creatine ratio correlating with higher-grade 
tumors find that useful or not? No, but it's true that the more rapidly cells are dividing, the higher the choline will be compared to creatine. And so by the time you get to over a two to one sort of ratio, you're looking at a viral, uh, not viral, <laughs> a, you're looking at a vig vigorously replicating cell population, but it doesn't really tell you that this is a glioblastoma as opposed to a metastasis or lymphoma. Let's move on to the next section, which is PET. So PET demonstrates the accumulation of FTG, representing increased glucose metabolism, which typically is greater than or similar to metabolism in grey matter. I guess the caveat here is that other lesions that aren't glioblastoma are also going to have increased FDG often. Um, FET, PET is something that's often... Mm, I don't do PET. You know what I feel like about nukes. <laughs> <laughs> well, move on to radiogenomics then. So a number of features are seen to correlate with molecular marker status, such as MGMT promoter methylation, which typically demonstrates higher ADC values, limited surrounding edema, and low cerebral blood volume. This has a sensitivity of 79% and specificity of 78%. Oh, there's some little stats in there. <laughs> As opposed to PET, I think you are interested in probably talking about methylation, MGMT. So let's talk about what MGMT is first, which is mm -hmm. O6-methylguanine DNA methyltransferase. That Yep. That goes down big at parties too, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a little small room yeah, <laughs> on the side yeah. of Micro, a party all... with a bouncer on the door. It's like, <laughs> could, you, could you say what MGMT stands for? And then, oh. <laughs> Do you know, actually, as a complete um, aside, years ago, my wife and I came back from a holiday and uh, we'd been in Thailand or somewhere a bit dodgy and we were like uni students and we looked pretty dodgy at this stage anyway. And we came through customs and we'd gone through the passport check area and we're just wandering down towards baggage claim. And this guy in a suit with a badge, like a TSA badge or whatever, equivalent in Australia, uh, came yeah. up to us and said, oh, excuse me, can you uh, come over here? And we said, okay. And he says, oh, it says here you're both uh, doctors. We went, yep. <laughs> and he said, what's cyclophosphamide? Ah, uh -huh, he was testing And you. we're like, uh... Oh, it's something to do with tumors. We don't really know. We're a radiologist. Ask us about an MR scan. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, he, he let us go. But so they must have a list of questions that are specific to your profession. Yeah. So if you said, I'm an engineer, and it's like, well, if I have a 12-ton truck traveling across. <laughs> <laughs> or a mathematician. At what time, if train leaves station A, and I, I have a similar one. When we went to the US with Wife of the Podcast, we were going through customs, right? And the guy looks at our passports and he looked at us and he says, how long have you guys been married? And <laughs> my wife and I looked at each other and neither of us could work it out. And we were like, <laughs> maybe he's got it written on his screen there. It says birth, death, marriages. It knows when we were married. And we we're like, oh, seven years. And he was like, yeah, that's a typical response. Good one. Yeah, if, you, <laughs> you go. if you'd said yeah. 22 years, that's like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. suspicious. Yeah, they must have rehearsed that. <laughs> All right, so back to MGMT, <laughs> Sorry. Gala. Yeah, so MGMT, it's a DNA repair enzyme. And the importance of this is that when you're looking at treatment for glioblastoma, which we'll get to later, the primary treatment is radiotherapy and temozolomide, both of which do their thing by damaging DNA, which cells that are replicating quickly don't repair adequately. And so during mitosis, they die. If you have very active MGMT, it will undo a lot of that damage, particularly of temozolomide, and therefore you have a bad prognosis because your response to therapy is no good. From a diagnostic point of view, pointless. It's really only extremely useful in predicting whether you're going to get pseudoprogression or not. If you have methylated MGMT, meaning it's not active, then you won't undo all that damage that temozolomide and radiation do and therefore you are more likely to get pseudoprogression. So the literature is full of radiologists to a degree trying to justify why we still need to perform scans by trying to come up with these uh, radiogenomic markers where the imaging appearances 
um, correlate with what you will eventually find when you do the molecular tests. Mm. In wealthy, well-provisioned regions of the world who have access to next-generation sequencing and all the different histological and uh, molecular tests, then a lot of these uh, are, are really pointless because you'll end up resecting this and you'll end up sending it to the lab and mm. that is much better than what you get on a scanner. The real importance of understanding that these radiogenomic markers exist is for the large parts of the world where they don't have access to that molecular uh, testing. And so recognising that you can make an educated guess as to MGMT methylation status based on imaging is useful down the track when you see what you think might be pseudoprogression. I pulled a couple of quotes from Lee Alalali's talk on imaging of the post-operative tumour brain, and she said one of her classic quotes was, this is one time where meth is good for you, so having <laughs> methylation is good in terms of yes. treating your tumour. And the other thing she said is unmethylated is unlikely to be pseudoprogression. So if you're seeing enlargement of the enhancing mass yeah. on your three-month post-operative scan, which is when you're kind of expecting you know, maybe pseudoprogression to occur, if they're an unmethylated patient, then that's unlikely. It's probably tumour. Whereas if they're a methylated patient, then yeah, that could well be yeah. pseudoprogression, which we'll talk about later, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. This has been going on <laughs> quite a long time already, Dixon. <laughs> All right, the next section is the radiology report, Gaylard. So when reporting a new diagnosis of a mass that is likely a glioblastoma, it is useful to include morphology, so the size in three dimensions, presence and degree of central necrosis, non-enhancing tumour involving cortex, deep grey matter or white matter, and for that you should look at the ADC values. The next point is the relationship to or involvement of eloquent areas major white matter tracts and large vessels. And then the third thing is extension. Look for extension across the midline, into the brainstem, subependymal spread, and CSF dissemination. I think this is a really important section, Gaila, because this is, in terms of the primary reporting of a tumour, this is really what you should be looking at. And in the tumour board meeting, this is what you're trying to come up with. Is it involving eloquent cortex? Which white matter tracts are involved? Do I need to do some DTI imaging prior yeah. to surgery to work this kind of stuff out? You know, is there evidence of CSF dissemination or subependymal spread? These are kind of the things. And then after the surgery, that's when you get into the more complex pseudoprogression versus recurrence kind of stuff. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot that you can do to help the surgeons plan, well, not just the surgeons, but the oncologists and the radiotherapists um, plan treatment with a good first report. And mm. one of the most important parts here is, as I mentioned before, not obsessing about the enhancing component. Because in my experience, non-radiologists will almost invariably stare at the post-contrast imaging when looking at glioblastoma. And missing an area of non-enhancing tumour can be really problematic for ongoing management. And here are a couple of scenarios where that really matters. Let's say you miss an area of non-enhancing tumour remote from the initial tumour and it doesn't get picked up by anyone until after they've had their radiotherapy, then the field will have been shaped to include the resection cavity and a couple of centimetres around the sides. But if it misses that extra area, that area has been undertreated it won't be able necessarily to receive any booster doses for radiotherapy in the future. And in some circumstances, you'll see it really aggressively growing very quickly. Uh, whereas if you'd noticed it to begin with, it may have been able to be resected or at least included in the primary radiation field. The other side of it is if you underestimate the extent of disease, you're kind of urging your surgeons to be more aggressive. And you may end up in a situation where you end up with neurological deficits due to a genuine attempt to get macroscopic um, resection, maximal safe resection, as they say, but that doesn't always end up being completely safe. And that's fine if you're exchanging that for a chance of longer term survival. But if there's clearly non-operable disease, then you know most surgeons will elect to have a more conservative approach to therapy and steer away yeah. from areas of the brain which are 
may cause deficits. And so I spend more of my time defining tumors based on T2 slash flare and ADC because all those three sequences, and it's not like one is the best. It really depends on the tumor, which one will help you see it. But that will give you a sense of how far tumor has extended and define the margins of where they should be irradiating. And make a better informed decision at the at the tumor board. We'll move on to the next section here. We're getting towards the end. Treatment and prognosis. Uh, so firstly, surgery. Maximal safe resection remains an important first step, not only debulking the tumor and reducing symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, but also providing tissue for formal diagnosis and assessment of the molecular features. Traditionally, the focus of resection has been removal of all enhancing tumor. This has been shown to result in improved survival. More recently, there is increased interest in supramaximal resection whereby not only is the component that is contrast-enhancing resected, but also adjacent non-enhancing tumour. More complete surgical resection can be aided by the use of intraoperative MRI and 5-ALA fluorescence-guided surgery. Yeah, just in the last year or so, Gaylard, our Mm -hmm. surgeons have really been advocating for ALA fluorescence to kind of help with the tumour margin. So basically the patient takes an ALA tablet, goes through the blood-brain barrier, and it's disproportionately absorbed into tumor cells. And then under blue light, the tumor will appear red. And at the margins, where there are fewer tumor cells infiltrating into the normal brain, that will go pink. And you can actually get an idea of further tumor when you're using this as a surgeon. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's important for radiologists to recognize, and if you get a chance to go and see a craniotomy for a tumor resection, I think it's really worthwhile because unlike lung cancer where presumably you know at surgery you have a lump and you can cut around it in resecting of these diffuse infiltrating tumors there's no margin that you can see mm-hmm. you sort of suck out the tumor and with a glioblastoma you tend to start within the cavity of the tumor and then work your way around the periphery and, and the enhancing hemorrhagic necrotic areas are kind of obvious And then you'll get into areas of the brain that look like, well, brain. And the idea of sucking out normal brain has to be a little bit disconcerting for surgeons. (laughs) And, And so it's not unexpected that the infiltrating component that you can't see easily on any, certainly not with the naked eye and not even with imaging that easily, And even with ALA, where it starts to become really faintly pink, that's what gets left behind. But so that's where this supramaximal resection, which for every tumor in the rest of the body is just called resection. (laughs) Because when you take a sarcoma, you take a margin out of it. When you take a melanoma, you take a margin from it. Uh, Brain tumors, you, you tend not to. But when a tumor is located somewhere where you can go well beyond the last bit where it's definitely tumor without causing a neurological deficit, you do get longer survival. And so they are those, you know, frontal pole, non-dominant frontal pole tumors Mm. that then end up being cured. So it is occasionally possible. And Mm. so ALA, I think, reassures surgeons that they're taking out tumor because it's glowing, even though it would otherwise look like normal brain. So the next section is adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So following surgery, post-operative adjuvant radiotherapy and chemotherapy with temozolomide is the most common treatment known as the STUP protocol. Newer therapies include anti-angiogenesis, e.g. bevazizumab, uh, brand name is Avastin, uh, and immunotherapy. Although in individuals less than 70 years of age, a standard STUP protocol is usual, in older individuals, the optimum treatment regime is less well established. This is particularly the case in the very elderly or those with significant comorbidities. In such cases, surgical resection has less marked survival benefit. Radiotherapy is usually administered as a shorter course, so 25 to 40 grays in 5 to 15 daily fractions, rather than 60 gray over six weeks, which is done in the younger patients. But even in this setting, adding temozolomide significantly increases survival, especially in MGMT methylated, so inactive tumors. So yes, being aware of treatment clearly isn't very important when 
assessing the first study and making the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But you really can't assess follow-up imaging for gliomas unless you've got a solid idea of what the therapies are and how they influence the likelihood of progression, pseudoprogression, and pseudo-response, which yep. I think we probably shouldn't go into because this has been going on for a very long time and we should have a separate episode on those Separate topics. episode. But, pseudoprogression, pseudo-response, very exciting. <laughs> but I, I think the importance here is that as radiologists, the idea that our responsibility ends with how things look on scans kind of is really increasingly missing the point of how we value add. And you do need to understand from the pathology side all the way through to treatment and complications. Yep. Especially that first three-month scan, you need to yep. know if the patient's timazolamide, avastin, methylated or not methylated, that kind of stuff, yep. in order to interpret it uh, to the best of your abilities. So next section is prognosis. Despite substantial advances, even in the best case scenario, glioblastoma carries a poor prognosis with a median survival of less than two years. Negative prognostic factors include increased necrosis, greater enhancement, deeper location, so thalamus, for example, MGMT not methylated, increased age, and lower pre-diagnosis functional status. Follow-up. This is a big section. Glioblastomas should be followed up closely with MRI. That's an understatement. Mm. So immediate post-operative imaging. Generally, a scan is obtained within 24 to 48 hours of surgery to assess residual disease. Early scanning is necessary to avoid post-operative enhancement that can make interpretation difficult. It should be noted, however, that some post-operative enhancement can occur within the first day post-surgery. And therefore, it is essential that these scans are interpreted alongside the preoperative scan. Yeah, so this is really important. This idea that, oh, there's a magical cutoff of 48 hours that, yeah. uh, you know, as long as you get your scan before then, you're fine. And after that, you'll get postoperative enhancement is just rubbish. There was a, a study, um, I don't remember when or where, but that looked at studies done within the first day or two following resection of a non-enhancing lesion. So they took mm -hmm. patients that had either non-enhancing tumors or focal cortical dysplasia or something else and mm -hmm. did a post-op scan with contrast. And they showed that a significant number developed enhancement even within 12 hours. Yep. So just because you obtain your scan early doesn't mean that everything you see is definitely residual tumor. And that last point, I think, is really important. You have to have the preoperative imaging side by side with your postoperative, because to say that there's residual enhancing tumor, it's not just showing that there is enhancement, but it's being able to point to the preoperative scan and say it's that bit that's been left mm -hmm. and you can match the contours. The other really useful part of that is you can predict where tumor is going to be left often based on the operative approach. Some places are harder for surgeons to get to. For example, if the tumor has a big overhang of non-involved brain that they need to get under, then that bit will often have bits of tumor left. Or, of course, if the tumor is getting close to eloquent areas, surgeons will be much less likely to be aggressive with a resection there. And so, again, comparing it to the preoperative one is really useful taking into account that the geometry may really have shifted because the necrotic cavity might have collapsed down, midline shift might have reduced, et cetera. So how do you word it on that first post-op scan within 24 hours if you see a linear area of enhancement that doesn't really correspond to any tumour that you saw on the so preoperative scan? I, I would exactly do that. I'd say although there is a small linear area of enhancement, this does not correlate morphologically to the preoperative scan mm -hmm. and may well represent early postoperative enhancement. And it's usually linear in your experience. If it's more nodular, mass-like, it's probably yeah, residual. Yeah, th that's true. And But usually it's either obviously one or the other. It's not that common to be umming and ahhing if you have the benefit of the preoperative scan because the enhancing components that are left behind are usually clearly matched to the preoperative area and you can sort of draw a line and go oh yeah that little lump there mm. that's, that's the bit. that bit because the bit they haven't resected the interface between it and the white matter next to it that won't have changed because they haven't resected it so you can see matching contour lines mm. 
The next section is ongoing imaging. Although timing and frequency will vary between institutions and treating surgeons slash oncologists, typically scans are obtained every eight to 12 weeks. Yes, the first scan often after that day one scan is at that kind of three month-ish mark. And that's because a couple of weeks after surgery is before they start doing the STUP protocol Mm -hmm. radiation and timazolamide. And that's when you're trying to look at the effects of that. So in individuals who have no residual macroscopic disease and remain stable for a protracted time, the frequency of follow-up imaging can be gradually decreased. In contrast, sometimes it is worthwhile performing an earlier scan to problem-solve ambiguous imaging features. The primary aims of ongoing follow-up are to identify tumour progression and complications, distinguish tumour progression from pseudoprogression, and distinguish pseudo-response from tumour progression. So these, I think we're going to skip over, but these are very much related to, in terms of pseudo progression, radiation necrosis, and some effects of the timazolamide. And in pseudo response, we're talking about the dramatic effects of Avastin in reducing the enhancement within a tumor, despite the fact that it's actually progressed. And that's for another time, Galen. I think so. I think so. <laughs> So we'll move on. The next section is response assessment criteria. So glioblastomas have been the subject of close trial scrutiny with many new chemotherapeutic agents showing promise. As such, a number of criteria have been created over the years to assess response to treatment. Currently, the response assessment in neuro-oncology, RANO or R-A-N-O criteria are the most widely used. Do you use the RANO much in practice, Gayla? No, I mean, we do in in trial patients, which Mm. are quite a lot of them, but it's not, it's much easier to say, please include RENO criteria than it is to actually do it well. Uh, They're not trivial to apply. The way that you measure some lesions and which axes to do it is fairly involved. And unless you have a academic department with significant trial patients and access to all the previous measurements, et cetera, it's pretty hard to to get it right. And it also doesn't contribute to that care of that individual patient often. It's more from a research point of view and and it makes it hard when you're employed clinically to do the job of reporting these scans to throw stuff in that you know is just for research purposes. It almost needs to be separately funded and separate time for the radiologist. And that's how we do it. We basically just give a clinical report and then um, someone goes off and a, a small number of radiologists go back and do the RENO assessments. Yeah, we do the same with things like resist and stuff for for other areas of oncology. Uh, History and etymology, this is always an interesting section. The original term glioblastoma multiforme was coined in 1926 by Percival Bailey and Harvey Cushing. The suffix multiforme was given to describe the various appearances of hemorrhage, necrosis and cysts. When in doubt and you're looking at the brain, if you don't know who someone created, named it, did it first, go with Cushing. You pretty much <laughs> pretty much did everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, differential diagnosis. I think this will be an interesting section to, to finish off with. So uh, feel free to jump in after each one of these, Gaylard. So general imaging differential considerations include, and we've got a list of quite a few. So the first one is astrocytoma, IDH, mutant, WHO, CNS, grade four. These may appear very similar slash indistinguishable, but they're generally younger patients and maybe look for that T2 flare mismatch sign, which can be very specific. Yeah, not too useful to be able to distinguish these really because they look so very similar and they'll have to come out in the same way. The surgical approach is exactly the same, so don't waste too much time. The younger the patient, the more likely they are to have a mutant. I think it just makes it, you know, if you're in a radiology exam, even more likely to say the term high-grade glioma because that will cover this one That's right. and glioblastoma rather than saying glioblastoma because technically the astrocytoma IDH mutant WHA grade 4 is no longer a glioblastoma. Yeah, and in a young patient, you may actually be looking at an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, which mm. strictly speaking is grade 3 because an oligodendroglioma can never grow up to be a grade four tumor, poor thing. You just can't do can't it. Can't do it. And so um, in a 35-year-old who has an ugly looking infiltrating primary brain tumor, just saying high grade glioma is definitely the way to go unless you want to get into the weeds of these kind of yeah. subtleties. The next differential diagnosis is cerebral metastasis. These may look identical. Both may appear 
multifocal. So if you see more than one, it doesn't necessarily mean it's metastases, but if you see them in lots of different spots and they're rounded, then that's probably going to be met. Look at maybe the CT scan, see if they've got anything in their chest, abdomen, pelvis. Metastases are usually centered on the gray-white matter junction and spare the overlying cortex. A little point here, it says RCBV in the edema of metastases will be reduced. Yeah, so I've seen or heard lots of radiologists dismiss the importance of distinguishing a solitary met from a glioblastoma. Obviously, the easiest thing to do is check to see if they've got known metastatic disease from another cancer, but often patients do present with a solitary met as their first indication of cancer. And the argument that, oh, it'll just have to come out anyway, is... uh, not very helpful. Firstly, Mm. if you've got metastatic disease, well, it might not need to come out because you might Mm. have things. But in fact, getting rid of a large cerebral metastasis, even in the presence of disseminated metastatic disease, can be really important from a quality of life. So just because you have metastases doesn't mean they shouldn't come out. But the biggest importance is that it really has a big difference in how the operation is explained to the patient and how the operation is carried out. Diffuse infiltrating tumors cause neurological deficit by diffusely infiltrating the brain. And when you chop out that tumor, the bit of brain that used to work goes with it largely. So any neurological deficit that a patient has due to a diffusely infiltrating tumor is likely not to get better after a section. Metastases, on the other hand, cause most of their deficits by compression and distorting of brain. And so when you resect the MET, many of those deficits actually come back. So from a prognostic uh, and consent point of view, that's an important part of the conversation. Yeah. You mean the deficits resolve rather than come back? That's right. Sorry. Um, The other important part is that from a surgeon's point of view, they approach these tumors quite differently. As I mentioned before, glioblastomas, you tend to get into the middle of them, suck out the necrotic center, and then work your way out to the peripheries. Whereas with a metastasis, they tend to try and find the edge of brain metastasis interface and then Mm. mobilize the MET from that edge, seeking to not disrupt the compressed, displaced brain as much as possible. So knowing which of the two uh, you're looking at does change how you perform your craniotomy, where you enter the tumor, and how you actually proceed with resecting. And distinguishing... um, There are a number of features that can make the diagnosis of a diffuse glioma um, with certainty that, if present, are really helpful. The main one is non-enhancing tumor. So, again, not focusing too much on the enhancing component, but looking at flare and T2. If you see an area of cortex that is expanded and thickened without enhancement, that is basically 100% that this is a diffuse infiltrating tumor and not a metastasis. Unfortunately, When that's absent, it doesn't tell you that it's definitely a metastasis because sometimes glioblastomas can look indistinguishable from a MET. And that's where looking at the edema around the lesion can be helpful. If you have raised choline, if you have raised CBV, you'll more likely be looking at an infiltrating tumor than a metastasis. The next differential diagnosis on the list, Gaylord, is primary CNS lymphoma. So this should be considered, especially in patients with AIDS, as in this setting, the central necrosis is more common. Yeah, in patients who don't have HIV, often uh, primary CNS lymphoma is a very solidly enhancing tumor without any central necrosis and makes it relatively easy to distinguish. And they have very high DWI, so very low ADC signal in a CNS lymphoma throughout the, the tumor. Uh, and also that the enhancement characteristics, I remember you talking about that, kind of often has that kind of hazy margin to it, the lymphoma. I found that very useful. Yeah, lymphoma usually just looks like lymphoma. And if you've looked enough at them, you, you won't be confused. But noticing or coming to the realization that what you're looking at is probably lymphoma is really important from a management point of view because generally, although I think there are some papers out there suggesting that resection might be good, Generally, you just biopsy and then treat with chemoradiotherapy. And so Mm. um, it it very much changes the approach there as well. And it also means that you should probably not treat with steroids if you think there's a chance it's lymphoma. Because if you give steroids, making the diagnosis histologically can become really challenging. And periventricular is another little tip for CNS lymphoma. Very often you see it in these kind of periventricular 
locations. Not that GBM can't happen there. It's just that if you see very solidly enhancing tumors around the, the ventricles, think CNS lymphoma. Yeah, so glioblastomas tend to spread along the subependymal surface like a little tongue of tumor, but their main mm. bulk is away from the ventricle, whereas lymphoma tends to sort of sit on the ventricle. Uh, the next one on the list is cerebral abscess. So a few features here to look out for. It'll have central diffusion restriction. However, remember glioblastomas, if they're hemorrhagic, can also have that. Presence of smooth and complete SWI. We spoke about that earlier, the dual rim sign. Yep. So, I mean, obviously distinguishing a glioblastoma from an abscess is important. If you can't, and you can't always, then it's better to say that it's an abscess than to dismiss something as a glioblastoma. Because they're going to be rapidly bad news. Yeah. The next one is tumor factive demyelination. It says can appear similar, often has an open ring pattern of enhancement, so that incomplete ring of enhancement, uh, and usually younger patients. Yeah, so this is super important because you really do not want to do a big resection of a tumor factive lesion. And so younger patients, uh, they hopefully have other lesions that you can see elsewhere, older mm. lesions, but you can get yep. tumor factive ADEM, for example, that might look very similar. We had one just the other day uh, transferred to our hospital, working up for presumed high-grade glioma, getting ready for surgery, and we're looking at the preoperative scan and we're like, hmm. It wasn't the best incomplete ring sign, but the presence of some Dawson's fingers elsewhere and other white matter lesions in a 40-year-old female. Yeah. And we were like, we think this is tumor effective demyelination. This this should not be operated on. We should we should wait on this one. So again, really important to have that in the back of your mind, particularly in those those younger patients. Yeah, absolutely. Next one here is subacute cerebral infarction, another one where we get a few every year, particularly PCA territory infarcts are mm. probably the most common because they often don't present acutely sometimes. And you have this cortically based enhancement because you're picking it up subacutely and that can be confused for a tumor. So the history is essential in this setting. It should not have elevated choline on spectroscopy and it won't have an elevated uh, CBV. But my tip there would be look for cortical, you know, gyroform pattern of enhancement. Yeah, and, and having th uh, volumetric imaging is really helpful because in some planes, the fact that it's gyroform may not be evident. Mm. And you usually find one plane where you can see that it's a cortical sort of distribution. And obviously, resecting a whole chunk of brain that you don't need to is not a good look for anyone, especially because this most likely is happening in patients who are not fantastic to begin with because it's uncommon for a young, healthy person to not notice that they've had a significant stroke. So this happens in your nursing home population or uh, patients with other illnesses or neurological issues that make assessment harder. And the very final differential we have here, Gaylord, is cerebral toxoplasmosis, especially in uh, patients with AIDS. Yeah, I mean, it's thrown in there. It's uncommon. Well, I guess it depends on how many severely immunocompromised or HIV AIDS patients you deal with. We don't see it very often. They can look very, very similar though, uh, particularly if it's yeah. basal ganglia lesion. We, we're an HIV hospital and we see some cerebral toxo, but I can't say it's ever been a huge problem differentiating no. from, from high-grade gliomas. Uh, that's it, Gaylord. We've made it to the end of the article. Mm. I've had a real wild type of a time. <laughs> how, how about you? It's been really good. I want to take up smoking. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we're probably going to have to do some kind of follow-up episode where we just go into post-operative kind of follow-up tumor imaging and talk a little bit more about pseudo-response, pseudo-progression, those kind of Well, you know, things. Dixon, I think we should only do that if the people request it. If the people request it. That's right. And how... Could the people get in contact with us to request it, Gaylord? Well, we're at Radiopedia on X and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylord and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. Although, in honesty, every time I say this, I feel sort of a bit dirty because if you write to me on X, it's, it's unlikely yeah. that you'll get a response. I've even stopped tagging you in, yeah. in when episodes get tweeted out. It's like, what's the point? He's not going to share it. He's not there. Yeah, so probably we should change this to just, you know, email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with ideas and or feedback. You know what we could include in this section, though, Dixon, which would be more relevant no. than Twitter? 
is the Radiopedia community forum. Yes. Because anyone who's got a Radiopedia account can uh, jump on and there I will respond. And that's at radiopedia.org slash chat. So okay. let's do that. You heard it. He will definitely respond 100% if you reach out to Frank in the Radiopedia community chat. Almost and, certainly. <laughs> oh, well, he's changed it. He's changed his diagnostic certainty. Uh, if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass to our online courses and conference. And in doing so, you'll be helping us to give free conference access to people in 125 low- and middle-income countries. And what else can people do, Gaylord? And you can also help us out by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Absolutely. Well, that was a long one, but a good one, Gaylord. I think people will enjoy that chat about glioblastoma. Thank you for uh, for joining me for oh, this one, fun. and we'll catch you all again. Hey, I think you've actually invited me for both lunch and dinner today. I can't do a one hour and twenty minute <laughs> podcast, a lunch and a dinner with you. I just can't get enough of day. you, Dixon. We won't have anything to talk about. <laughs> we'll be at dinner. We'll just be silence. I saw this. Um... This YouTube comedy clip on uh, Generation Z going to dinner and they're asking, you know, um, what does a chef recommend? And then it's like, what YouTube clips would you pair with each of these dishes? Because they want to <laughs> look at their phones. They're on their phones. That's a classic. <laughs> and we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay rad. Wild tide. Stay rad. <laughs> Palisade <and> necrosis. <laughs> see you, mate. See you next time. I'll see you at lunch, actually. Yep. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.